we're starting the final two panel sessions uh, for the symposium. Um, so we, first of all, we have uh, a panel with uh, presentations by Mary Evans and Yumsun Gulak, and then, uh, moderated by Koyo Kuo, and in discussion with Larry Achenpong and David Blandy. And then the panel is called Artists and Postcolonial Legacy. Uh, after that, we have a closing panel, Architecture and Memory, which is with presentations by John Logan and Dosh, uh, Dr. Ashlyn O'Donnell, uh, moderated by Quivin McGillalay. Um, and to conclude the symposium, we have closing remarks from Professor Luke Gibbons. Um, so uh, I'll hand over now to Koyo and the panel, and uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Woodrow. Uh, wonderful to see that you're still here with us. I'm very happy to uh, to be introducing this panel because it's a, it's a, like echantillon, a sample of uh, uh, all ideas that are running through the show. And uh, and as it looks like uh, with uh, the participating artists who are here, this panel is very much about other otherness and othering somehow. And I think that uh, through the work of uh, Young Sung that we will hear first, and Mary, and Larry, and, uh, and David, we will get to maybe understand a little bit better how this notion is uh, unpacked, transcended, transformed, interpreted, and so on. So, um, with uh, Jung Sung, I would, uh, you, you saw Jung Sung yesterday with her performance on, uh, uh, which is called the Reenact, Reenacting the, Trans, the Transnational Adoptee. Jung Sung is, uh, is a recognized uh, scholar and academic, and uh, she has participated uh, in, uh, in different exhibitions. She is, uh, of Korean and Danish origin and an activist operating at the boundaries of performance, poetry, video, sound, and installation art. And her work investigates the disruptions of re- and deconstruction and the disorientation that emerges from an exchange between the body, image, and the spoken word. And Yun Sung has, uh, I think that some of you have seen this uh, postcard, and uh, the first phrase of it uh, is very intriguing to me, and I hope that you will have some kind of uh, elaboration on it for us, where she writes that reenacting the transnational adoptee is interested in the life capability of a body of color by investigation, by investigating the adopted <coughs> subjects being in the world in a performative framework. Please, explain us that. <laughs> well, um, yes, I'm gonna speak now, it's actually Larry. And you have less than 20 minutes, I, know, I promised I know. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will try to do this in less than 20 minutes, I promise. <laughs> I will in this short presentation uh, suggest an approach and how to unfold the performance reenacting the transnational adoptee within the post-colonial discourse. The ideas and thought presented here are not mine. These stems from an analysis made by especially Erika Fischer-Lichter's Aesthetik des Performativen, Hans Theis Lehmann's Post-Dramatic Theatre, and Sarah Ahmed's Queer Feminology. My main claim is that transnational adoption is today one of the most visible and direct traces of a colonial tradition. Relocating resources into the Western world on the cost of colonialized countries and people. One could rightfully ask oneself, why do so many colored women have to give up their children? <coughs> why is the colored parents absent in the transnational adoption process? Why are the institutes, institutes processing children for transnational adoption always funded by the Western receiver countries? So the question stands, how come transnational adoption today is narrated into a discourse of humanitarian act and an act of the well-being of the child? My aim here is to present how to approach political potential in art. Through a short analysis of this performance, 
with the terms post-colonial and by highlighting how the linear normative understanding becomes disorientated and reinterpreted into a new understanding of the linear norm. I especially operate with the Eric Fischer-Lister's term of how the performative body can be seen as either a phenomenological body, where the body is experienced as a self-referential body, and actions and items and objects are part of that self-reference, or a semiotic body, where the body is experienced as a character on stage. Secondly, I offer the idea of the normative linear and the disruption of the linear. Lehman talks about politics as a structural linear understanding that frames society, a linear norm, where the theater or the performance can offer an abruption or disorientation of the linear, adding Armour's theory of how the performative body orients itself in the words she says, quote, the normative dis dimension can be redescribed in terms of a straight body, a body that appears in line. Things seem straight on a vertical axis when they are in line, which means when they are aligned with other lines. Rather than presuming the vertical line is simply given, we would see the vertical line as an effect of this process of alignment, unquote. Body that steps out of that line will be disorientated. So when is the subjective body bearer of a potential for political statement? And when can a performative stage point to a political performativity, hereby meaning not politics as such understood as the linear norm, but as a pointer to these structures, discourses, and linear understanding? My basic investigation is that performance is not politics as such, but has a relation to the political that makes it possible to point to the potential as constructed in a certain way and thereby opening up for the possibility of disclosure, change, and possible different potential. I am the bearer of a political potential as a performative action is an action of both self-reflection and an embodiment of a political character. Transnational adoption becomes something the body is and that influences shapes what the body can actually do. Through the performative action, certain historical cultural possibilities are embodied, and in that is inherited the possibility of resistance. My performance tries to use the social, the social situation of performance art in order to infuse it politically. As my performative action is an action of self-reference, my body is a phenomenological body, an action that both describes and creates, and through that constitutes reality it, in the performance itself, hence offering the topic transnational adoption from a new angle. Reenacting the transnational adoption is a clear phenomenological experience. Objects, actions, and items are self-referential, but I've tried to frame my body as a constant exchange between the phenomenological body and the semiotic body. I emancipate a body as a character on a stage with reference to a fiction, my interpretation of my origin that I can never fully grasp, and therefore have to fictionalize. It is my semiotic body as such that brings forth the experience of suffering, and not my phenomenological body as such that is suffering. Well, after feeling my body today, after yesterday's performance, I tend to question myself on that one, though. Working with transnational adoption, I have taken a topic that obviously will point to me as having a phenomenological position, but by primarily approaching the topic on a structural level, I can merge the phenomenological and the semiotic approach, and that the same thing goes on for the items and the objects, the text, soundscapes, and papers. Actually, I will skip uh, some of the, um, the next slides because I'm short in time. But I would just point to uh, some, one process then in order to, to, to explain uh, the linear and the disorientation. So some of the processes I mentioned in the next slide is not about the isolation, isolated performance, performance stage, but the orientation within transnational adoptions that I try to emphasize in order to make them reachable for an audience, but also to show the disorientation of the linear normative but as, as a structure and as a body. 
and I'm just going to run very quickly. I'm operating with transnational adoption, transracial adoption, and forced migration. The word trans is purposely used as terms describing the position of being in both positions and fluctuating between the binary interpretation of who you are, both and, neither or, and is a description of the violence in which the adoptee's body is forced into an alienated position in all levels. I will in the next slides focus on the term disorientation and give some very exact examples of that disorientation. My very simplified claim here is that the norm of the indigenous people or the colonized countries was disorientated by the colonization, forced into a new linear Western norm which create a new disorientation. And that exact same pattern goes for transnational adoption structures. One of the main consequences for the body to be seen as is already defined instead of a body uh, that experience is the disorientation that I try uh, to display. When disorientation is, is, is experienced, we try to logically rephrase the elements of disorientation into a linear understanding, trying to remove the, the crooked disrupted line to fit the normative line. The fail to reproduce the normative line will be seen as abnormal or from there often new disorientations will rise. I will go through some of the process that creates disorientation with the transnational adoption system and the attempt to reproduce normative lines that just creates new disorientations. The disorientation is uh, the fact that the normative line in general offers an understanding of children belonging to the parents or the community. The disruption will be in the need of, uh, for resources, infertile parents in the Western world, and the reinterpretation in order to create a new normative line will be, it is for the sake of the child, it is saving the child, it is offering it, uh, the child a better life. Thereby, the traditional colonial approach of exploiting resources is reinterpreted into a new norm. And the discourse is uh, reestablished with the normative line that allows an upside down logic. I'm just going to show one example of that upside down logic and <coughs> skip the rest. But one of the upside down logic is the norm of policy. Normally, uh, within transnational adoption, you operate with uh, what we call the BNP per inhabitant. These are numbers from the CIA. And I have chosen the, the most wealthy, Qatar, and the most poor, Congo, within the BNP uh, numbers. And in that, I have chosen uh, two receiver countries, Denmark and USA, Scandinavia in general, is very strong in receiving uh, children from abroad. And then three uh, major uh, giver countries, South Korea, Colombia, and China. And what we can see in these numbers is, if we use the BNP numbers, yes, Denmark and USA is very high, where South Korea, Colombia, and China is lower, which would be what everybody expects when we talk about transnational adoption. But if we go into what we call the poverty line within the country itself, meaning measuring how many people in the country itself lives uh, uh, below the minimum, what you would call the minimum uh, level of, uh, of uh, income that you can live from, you can actually see again Qatar is, has a very, low, a very low number of persons that lives below the poverty level and Congo has a very high number which totally fluctuates with the BNP. But if you look at the other countries, if you look at Denmark and the USA, they are like an average of what we call the numbers of people, around 20% of the people in Denmark and the state lives below the poverty line in the country. But whereas South Korea, Colombia, and China is interesting because if you look at China, they are actually lower <coughs> in the poverty line than Denmark and the USA. And this is just to show that we talk about poverty as a norm, normative line, it is constructed within a certain discourse that means that if you actually drill these numbers, these constructions do not stand. I will skip the rest of the, the things because um, I think you kind of get the idea, but yeah. Um, so within transnational adoption, there are, uh, one can trace three major one can trace three major uh, disorientations. The emotional disorientation of the trauma of losing original family reinterpreted into happiness 
or as being lucky for having offered a Western family. The colonial disorientation of erasing of previous and indigenous history into a colonialized, no colonialized norm of how the world looks, the value of culture and religion, and the human rights disorientation of the child as having a certain set of rights uh, disorientated by the adoption structure, actively creating a new set of laws and convention, and thereby erasing these rights. And I'm going to skip this well, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> Just to state that the performance the performance is not, is not an academic practice alone. The cost of transnational adoption is real. Each individual body is bearer of the science of this structure and experience the stress and loss of trying to fit into the normative line. The political potential in performance is therefore, from my work, the ability of disorientate the existing normative line to point to the powerful white heteronormative line and transform my phenomenological experience to the audience using my body as a semiotic tool, reinterpreting the norm, and thereby using it as a means to point to the mean and not to the goal, so to speak. Armand described whiteness as a familiar heritage, not a biological determined, but performative by making a certain set of objects accessible, an orientation that makes certain objects reachable. The same way is race, not as so much what the body is, but more what the body can do. Is it, it is a process that hides its own processual character, so to speak. My body's semiotic character, therefore, is not as much about what it is, but more what it do. But still by doing, in all the whiteness, it disorientates the same whiteness and points to its position as whiteness being brought upon me, not as a, as a voluntarily position I can walk in and out from, but as a position from where I can perform the disorientation. Thank you so much to Eva International and Koyo Ko to invite me back to this wonderful opportunity to perform my piece. I hope through these 10, 15 minutes, <laughs> uh, I have uh, offered you some interpretation of how performance art has political potential that goes beyond politics and aesthetics, and how the colored body actually can possess power <laughs> to define a new linear norm by dis uh, disorientating the existing and thereby creating a performative space both in the realm of the art and the, in the realm of the political. Is it a, pop, uh, is it a po popular position to take within the art world? I think not. Is it necessarily so bleedingly yes? As the world looks today, we can as artists be powerful activists too by constantly challenging the realm of the post-colonial post power we live in. Thank you.